Hi everyone, I'm Dr Lindsay Murray from the School of Psychology, University of Chester, and today I'm going to be giving you a brief taster about animal psychology, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have if you want to put them in the chat. Now this is Minnie, she's one of my menagerie that I have here at home, and because Minnie is a female cat, she might have a tendency and a preference to use her right paw more. Right paw, there we go, that's a good girl right there. Um, more for swiping at things and behaviours like that, more than her brother Bear might. Um, here's, here's her brother Bear, just to show off more of my pets. She and her brother Bear, and then my dogs alongside. Now, paw preference, or pawedness, is one aspect of laterality to do with hemispheric brain functions and which, which hand, etc. we use. Um, and that's just one of the interesting areas of animal psychology. Now, we as humans, tend to be about 95% of us are, are right-handed, predominantly right-handed for tasks, and amongst our closest relatives, chimpanzees, they're often right-handed as well, but it can actually depend on the specific task that they're doing. So some um, chimps might use their right hand for, say, uh, tool use, and they'll use their left hand for reaching. And then, of course, when the chimps do a lot of grooming, and that would be utilising both hands. Now, if you think about cats and dogs, some of our most beloved and common pets, um, you might think that both of those species would show certain hand or paw preferences like we do. But actually, the evidence suggests that dogs don't tend to show any consistent preferences for paw. Um, but cats do, so why might that be? Well, one theory is that it might be to do with predator-prey relations. So if you think about how cats hunt, they would actually use their paws for swiping, using the claws obviously as well, and it might therefore make sense for them to, to strengthen a particular paw and use that one more. Whereas dogs, they don't tend to show any preferences. They of course rely on their teeth much more than their, their paws for hunting. So it could be something to do with that. Um, the sex differences, it's harder with, as with a lot of areas in, in psychology and animal psychology too. We, we still have a lot to figure out, so we don't really know why there would be these particular sex differences so much. But if you want to go off afterwards and, and study your own dog or cat, um, and you want to remember which way around it is, then I've done a little visual aid for you. You can just kind of remember that females are usually right. Okay. So, what is animal psychology then? Um, it's the study, if you like, of the minds, behaviours, social relationships and interactions between animals within a community and how they relate to other species and that includes us as humans as well. So we want to try to understand non-human species and we want to try and understand them at a species level but also at an individual level as well. So if we look at chimpanzees, for instance, we want to be able to understand them and hopefully predict their behaviour. And if we can do that, then we might be able to help them in terms of animal welfare, conservation and their well-being. And we can also learn a lot about how animals, non-human animals, affect us as humans as well and improve the lives of humans. So for instance, in these really uncertain times that we're all living through at the moment, there's already a lot of research going on showing the importance of pets for our own mental well-being as well. And this kind of animal psychology, comparative psychology, brings together and draws on a lot of related fields, including general psychology, evolutionary biology, and ethology as well. So at Chester, we offer some animal input throughout the degree, and by third year, if you want to, you can specialise in um, studying animal psychology for your dissertation project, which is a double module, and you can take the optional animal psychology module, and that would mean that you'd actually be spending half of your time in third year um, looking at animals, non-human animals. Um, some examples of topics that our dissertation students have done um, are some zoo projects often looking at uh, visitor effects, so there's some evidence that human visitors at the zoo have, yes, perhaps some negative influence on, on the animals. There's some actually that says they can have a positive influence too, and you'll probably not be surprised to hear that there's some research evidence that shows no effect at all. Um, so it's very mixed, as is, as is often the case. Some of the students we've had doing projects at the zoo have looked at visitor effects in combination with something like laterality um, in elephant herds. I've had quite a few students studying the elephant herd there. 
um, social networks, mother-infant interactions in a variety of species, including the chimpanzee group, looking at individual differences in personality, including even psychopathy um, and dominance in chimpanzees and other animals as well. And also we have students in, in non-zoo settings, so some students have connections with dog kennels or horse stables, and will often study the relationships between those animals and their human owners and trainers. We had a student who studied the effect of essential oils on kenneled puppies and found it had a, a lavender oil had a relaxing effect on the kenneled puppies. So you might be wondering, oh, thank you me again. <laughs> You might be wondering what kind of work can you go on to do with animal psychology? Well, you might want to become an animal behaviourist. Um, now, that would require a bit of further accreditation, and then you can work on referral from vets or set up your own practice. Um, this is a popular model in the US where people are prepared to pay quite a lot of money to take their, their wonky dog along to, um, to see what they can do because he's behaving badly. And very often, of course, it ends up being the, the human owners that need a bit of fixing. Now one of the earliest uh, and most famous animal behaviourists in, in the UK here was Dr Roger Mugford, who set up his own company of animals. He was the inventor of the halty collar that was a useful aid to stop dogs pulling on the lead and to develop that idea and invent that um, he, put, he drew on his work with horses and was thinking about how they're much better at being led by the head so he used the same principle for the halty collar with, with great success, commercial success too. And he even advised the Queen as well at one point. She had, uh, I think, nine corgis and there was a bit of aggression, in-house aggression, so he was able to advise her on some strategies that she could put to use to try to help um, the infighting there. So as well as becoming an animal behaviourist, you might also want to go into various conservation and welfare roles, both in wildlife management and in captive settings, including zoos and sanctuaries or work perhaps for organisations like the RSPCA or the Dogs Trust. So some more examples to give you a taste of animal psychology. The focus is often on species that are more similar to ourselves, I guess, so our fellow primates, non-human primates, and other large-brained and social mammals like elephants, whales and dolphins, and that's perhaps, there's more attention to those species perhaps because of our shared biology, but also because of the unique differences that are really interesting as well. But we're learning more and more about other species, including birds, especially the clever corvids, how they're affected by pollution, both light and noise pollution, um, that we humans make, of course, and how they're changing rapidly to adjust to this. And, for instance, you might have heard more birds singing at night in recent months, years, and especially now, um, because you can hear them more because there's less traffic on the roads, but they've done that as a, as a quick adaptation because they realise it's quieter at night when there's less traffic on the roads um, and they can sing better. But they're actually also developing larger and stronger muscles in their diaphragms to sing their, their songs as well. And some of that um, adaptation is, is really rapid. And that's an interesting area of research, it's called HIREC. It stands for Human Induced Rapid Environmental Change. And it's showing us how lots of different animals are highly adaptable. They're changing their diets, they're changing their territories, their social behaviours, their use of space, very rapidly because of us, really. So, for example, we've all heard of urban foxes. We've got lots of different animals, deer as well, coming into cities and towns. Um, we have bears visiting um, garbage dumps and, and campsites because they're being opportunistic and they're, they're finding easier sources of, of food to get. Um, and we're also gaining a greater understanding of some of the less attractive species, I guess. Um, so, in, for instance, there was a recent study showing that in vampire bats, they form friendships surprisingly like our own. And I think when we understand more about these less well-known and less relatable species, then that increased understanding will hopefully mean that we'll care more too. So one of my research areas is mirror self-recognition. So often pet owners will feel sure that their cat or their dog 
can recognise itself in the mirror. But when you ask them what they actually do in front of the mirror, what they tend to describe are social responses. So a dog, for instance, would get down into a play bow position and um, they would bark excitedly, for instance. Um, and here I have, Minnie's lying right at the moment, but <laughs> here, no, no, no. sorry, there we go. Here is, is, this is, this is good, isn't it? This is a, a picture, if you can just make out of a gorilla that was in um, a study that I did and just published a paper in the Journal of Comparative Psychology this year. And he's actually not looking in a mirror, but he's looking in, in, a, in a television monitor at his live video self. And hopefully you might be able to just make out, he's pulling his, pulling his mouth down, manipulating his jaw so that he can look inside his mouth. And that's a rare instance of some evidence that looks very strong like he's exploring himself and that's very suggestive then of, of self-recognition. And gorillas are a bit odd in that they're not giving us that much evidence yet that they can recognise themselves. So the gold standard objective test of self-recognition is the Mark test by Gordon Gallup in 1970. And that's where paint is, is applied to the forehead of an animal, such as a chimpanzee. And then when they look back into the mirror after that, they're supposed to show evidence that they recognise their, their altered image. <clears throat> Excuse me. But young, uh, young children can typically do this at about two years of age, but of course they've got a lot of um, help and assistance from their caregivers. Uh, for instance, parents will say, you know, who's that in the mirror? That's you and everything. Obviously non-humans don't have all that. And one of the most interesting aspects of these self-recognition studies is actually that it's, it's not all individuals of a given species that will give us this evidence. They won't all pass the mark test. So even in chimpanzee studies, there, there, there might be a dozen or so chimpanzees and only some of them are passing the test. Um, there was an elephant study where it was only one elephant that passed the mark test. Um, and I wonder if you can guess how the newspapers headlined the story. This elephant was called Happy, so they said, she's happy and she knows it. Um, amuses me anyway. Um, so even though it is just some individuals of species, this gives us an indication obviously that these different species have the capacity for mirror self-recognition. Um, and we, we can work out reasons to, you know, why, why some may and some may not recognize themselves. But whereas we've got some evidence then, quite a lot of evidence that chimpanzees, for instance, can recognise themselves in mirrors, we just don't have that for monkeys, who, who obviously are also very closely related to us. Even after thousands of hours of mirror exposure, monkeys will usually persist in thinking and responding to the images if it was a conspecific, so that's another monkey, so they'll invite it to play or they'll perhaps charge it aggressively. They'll even look and reach behind the mirror trying to find the other monkey but they just don't seem to give us the evidence that they can really understand that it's their own image. Um, and that kind of divide between monkeys and apes, and of course we're apes, we're one of the great apes along with gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees, bonobos, that kind of divide can give us some info, insight into the evolutionary history or story of a given capacity like um, mirror self-recognition. But we always need to be flexible and take on board new emerging evidence and be prepared to change that kind of story of what we think we know about something. For example, there are now quite contentious claims coming in for mirror self-recognition in very different animals like birds and fish. Another example of animal psychology is cooperation in animals. So many species demonstrate cooperation, for instance, in orcas, otherwise known as killer whales, they will line themselves up and create a forward charge, a synchronised forward charge, which will tip a seal off an ice flow into the sea. So they're cooperating and then they'll, they'll share the, the food. Two male lions may form a coalition to more successfully and more easily take over um, a new pride from, from an existing male. What will then follow likely is infanticide where the males will kill the existing cubs in the pride. Um, that not only has the effect of wiping out potential rivals for their own um, offspring that will be born in the future, but what it does also is it brings the females back into estrus very, very quickly because they stop lactating. So that means that the new male or males 
can make with these females as quickly as possible and sire their own offspring. So it makes a lot of sense. It's hard for us as humans to, to comprehend or fully understand. It's hard for us to, to watch or know about these things that goes on, but it makes perfect sense for the lion's imperative to, to reproduce. Zebras go one step further and they actually harass females while they're in foal so that they abort and that again is, is making sense because it stops the, the female's maternal investment in that fetus at the earliest possible stage. There's a body of interesting comparative research as well on dogs and wolves. As descendants of, of pack animals, our domesticated pets, and I've got some around me here, they still have a need for some kind of hierarchy and, and our dogs, our pet dogs, will look to us as their owners, as the alpha, alpha male and female, or whatever, um, as, as their alphas anyway in the pack. And it's really interesting to see some of the research on cooperative abilities in wolves and dogs. Um, so there's a standard test, uh, which I've got a picture here of, you can see from Marshall Prestini et al's paper, where two animals need to work together to pull strings at either end of a, of a table, um, to gain a food reward and they must work together if one animal pulls a string just at their end it won't work um, and what you find is that wolves have no problem with this at all and they they can even wait for their companion to come out in a delayed version of the task and then they'll cooperate together to do it dogs however sadly will tend to sit there looking at the human researchers for guidance um, and one suggestion for this kind of change is, is the domestication hypothesis that Brian Hare and some, some of his colleagues have put forward, which basically is saying that we've kind of bred out of our domestic dogs all their natural inclination to cooperate with each other. And instead, our pet dogs are cooperating with us, their human owners. And this is, of course, the, the loyalty that we, we know and covet in our dogs. A related concept is fairness. Now, you might think it would be challenging to design a, a study, a psychological study that could get at something like that, investigate a concept such as fairness. But this was accomplished by Franz de Waal and his team in a classic study with capuchin monkeys. So what they did was have some capuchin monkeys side by side in experimental cages, um, and they would have to give the experiment, the researcher, a rock and in doing so they would then be rewarded with some food. Now for as long as the two monkeys side by side received the same reward, a piece of cucumber, all was fine, all was good, they carried on doing it, but then they mixed things up and when their neighbour started getting a more prized food reward, a grape, and, and the, the monkey that was still getting the cucumber saw that, then they, they did not like that and they actually showed their disdain by, by throwing the cucumber back at the experimenter. Um, it must have been very hard for those researchers to, to do that, but it nevertheless was a, a sort of genius way of showing us that these monkeys definitely had a concept of fairness. So the, the grape outweighed the cucumber. Cucumber was no longer any good. Another area I'm going to mention today is tool use. Now this is an area that's fraught with problems of definition. Most of the definitions imply the need for, for hands, more or less, because they talk about picking up objects. They also talk about um, some form of environmental manipulation. So I have another picture. And we have Betty. She's a famous New Caledonian crow. And you might be able to just make out there that she has a piece of wire uh, apparently coming out of her mouth. This was a famous study, came out in 2002 by um, Weir et al, um, showing that when given a, a piece of straight wire to try to, to hook a little food bucket with to get it to come out of the tube, the crow realised that a straight wire, wire was no good, so she modified this tool and bent it into a hook form and then of course was able to kind of fish dip into the tube and had success in bringing out the food bucket. So that created a real storm in the scientific community when that piece of research came out. Subsequent studies have shown that it actually is quite a common natural behaviour for these crows in the wild. They do bend sticks um, and so this task was actually mimicking a wild behaviour 
where these crows will bend twigs and sticks. So that's making tools, just as Jane Goodall found with her chimpanzees in the 60s in Gombe. So they're making these tools and it's mimicking what they do because they, they, they bend the, the sticks and put them in tree holes to get beetle larvae. Um, and it's thought that these crows probably learn to use and make tools like this to exploit those kind of food resources because strangely in, on the island of New Caledonia there are no uh, woodpeckers and those would be the kind of uh, species that would compete or are also utilise that kind of food source. So as there aren't any woodpeckers, the crows realised they could get at these um, grubs in the trees by making tools. And the crows appear to be born with a propensity to make tools this way and to use tools, but learning is also being shown to play a part, so that's a, a good example, therefore, of nature-nurture interaction. The final area I'm going to talk about today is personality. Many years ago now, I studied the group of chimpanzees at Chester Zoo, along with some in other zoos, and I documented individual differences in personality according to three main factors. Those were confidence, sociability, and excitability. Um, here we are, my final prop picture of the day. This is Boris, the lovely Boris. He's become a bit of a TV star, actually, from The Secret Life of the Zoo. Um, and he's a, a, a famous character in Chester, in the UK, and around the world now as well. Um, he was the alpha male when I was studying the group at Chester, um, and he emerged as a socially confident personality type. And this is um, me and him playing chase. He likes to play chase still when I visit at the zoo. Um, and I found differences in personality according to, to age and sex and to how the chimps were reared and grouped as well. And there were links between personality and other behaviours. So um, one interesting link I found was that immatures who were higher on confidence, they actually spent more time investing in being near higher ranking males. So it was as if they were starting a bit of Machiavellianism in working their way, ingratiating themselves into the group and hopefully working their way up, I guess. Um, and fast forward, of course, 20 years or so, I now have students going to Chester Zoo and studying the same group, which is fascinating for me to see as well. Um, and it's a very interesting time as well, at the, the group in Chester as well, because Boris was the alpha male when I was studying him, the, the group, um, and the young male Dylan, who's been alpha male for some time now, he's currently now being challenged himself by uh, a young adolescent called Carlos. Um, so we're seeing some changes a foot there and with the loss of the alpha female and a new female being introduced in recent years into the group the females are also still sorting themselves out um, and sorting out their own hierarchy and often this is not as linear as male hierarchy what you see sometimes is more groups of low ranking middle ranking high ranking individuals in some other species Aspects of personality are observed in the form of behavioural roles that are played or maternal styles. So in dolphins, what you can see are mothers that are of different types. So some mums, some dolphin mums are controlling. So if their calves, for instance, are straying too far, they'll discipline them much more heavily and consistently. And then you'll get some less controlling dolphin mums and then you'll get some that are kind of in the middle. In grey squirrels, we see two different maternal styles. Um, both of which work in terms of the imperative of, of rearing your offspring to survival. So they work primarily because of a balancing selection that's related to the ecology. So stay-at-home mums, what we might want to call a bit lazier mums, less active mums, they conserve energy in times of food scarcity, while more active mums who are always out there trying to find as much food as possible and who do find more food, they're of course expending a lot of energy in doing so they'll thrive more in times of food abundance. So very different maternal styles, but both work because of the different fluctuations in food availability. And on that note, I think I'll sign off for now and let you go and put the kettle on. So do please ask, uh, get in touch if you have any questions about animal psychology and I'll be really happy to, to help. And that just leaves me to say, stay safe and keep well everyone. Bye bye.